be at 1130. John 14 and verse 1. Jesus says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it weren't so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come back and take you to be with me so that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place that I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We've been looking at unseen things for the last few weeks. Paul says we fix our eyes on the things that are unseen. Because the things that are seen are temporary, but the things that are unseen are eternal. We've talked about spiritual beings. We've talked about angels, both holy and fallen. We've talked about demons. Hell is in the unseen realm. We talked about that last week, and we don't really want to go back there. If last week was your first week hearing me, welcome back. I'm glad you made it. Heaven is also in the unseen realm. I've been preaching for 28 years now, and I've never before preached an entire sermon on either heaven or hell. But you know, it's important that we think about both. It's important that we talk about both. It's important that we're clear on what we believe. The hope of heaven fuels our patient endurance in this life. It gives us staying power. It puts everything else in this life in proper perspective. The fear of hell fuels Christian love and compassion for others. How is Jesus able to love his enemies? How is he able to pray for those who persecute him? How is Paul able to continue loving and preaching to those that unjustly uh, punished him? It's because Jesus and Paul were both keenly aware that the men who were persecuting them were in jeopardy of a horrible destiny. In recent times, preaching on heaven and hell has been belittled as an old-fashioned gospel. But really, can I tell you, it's just the gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus, that whoever believes in him should not perish forever in hell, but should have everlasting life forever in heaven. What could possibly be more important in this life than making sure that we escape hell and that we enter heaven? What could possibly be more important than making sure that the people that we love, that the people that we know, that the people that are within our reach also escape hell and enter into heaven? You know, one of the most overlooked subjects in theology and in preaching and teaching is heaven. The truth is that most of our ideas about heaven come from a mix of Renaissance paintings, bad contemporary Christian art, TV talk shows, Hollywood movies, but we really don't know very much what the Bible says about heaven. There are lots of books that describe people's journeys to heaven, and I suppose they're inspiring, but there are very few books that discuss seriously what the Bible says about heaven. Even in most systematic theology books, heaven appears in the last one or two pages. I, I have a 737-page systematic theology book in my office by Louis Burkhofer, and guess what? Heaven appears on page 737. But we have so many more questions than that about heaven. And the Bible has so much more to say than that about heaven. So I want to look at some scriptures with you this morning. And I, I want us to talk about the 411 on heaven. The 411 on heaven. There are four truths that I want to share with you quickly. Four truths about heaven. The first truth is this. There is only one thing that matters about heaven. There is only one thing that matters about heaven. Have you ever thought about the questions that people ask about heaven? There was one survey that identified 35 of the most frequently asked questions about heaven. Here's the top 10. 
Will I recognize my loved ones in heaven and will they be able to recognize me? That was number one. Will there be animals in heaven? Specifically, will my pet be in heaven? Will I still be married to my spouse in heaven? Now, I want you to notice these are in order of, of importance, and people asked about their dog before they asked about their... I don't know what, the, I don't know what to say. <clears throat> will we be bored in heaven? What will we do in heaven? What will our bodies be like in heaven? What age will we be in heaven? The women asked that. Will we eat in heaven? The men asked that. What will heaven look like? Will there be trees and mountains and lakes? How, here's an interesting one. How can I be happy in heaven if I know that my loved ones are lost in hell? Those are all very interesting questions, and actually the Bible answers every one of them, although perhaps not to our liking. But it occurs to me that every one of those top ten most frequently asked questions is missing something. It completely misses the point of heaven. Here is a much better set of questions. What will the eternal God, the ancient of days, the creator of the universe, the author of life, the father of mankind, what will he look like when we get to heaven? What will it be like when we see him for the first time? What will the face of God look like? No one has seen God at any time. Even the seraphim that are forever in the presence of God in the throne room have wings with which they cover their eyes for they cannot look on God who lives in unapproachable light and who is an all-consuming fire. But there is a day that we will stand and we will look upon his face. What will his eyes look like? What expression will he be wearing on his face? What will his form look like? What will his posture be? Will he be sitting majestically in his throne? Or will he stand up to receive you like he did Stephen? What will you feel in that moment when you look at Jesus and he looks directly back at you? What will that moment be like when the barrier of sin is completely removed and the union between you and Christ is consummated? He will know everything about you. But there won't be any shyness or shame or embarrassment or awkwardness. There will only be pure joy. What will that moment be like when you are touched by the hand of God? when he takes you into his arms and he pulls you into his chest, when he takes his hand and he brushes the tears away from your eyes, when he kisses you on the forehead and his lips leave the imprint of his holy name there, what will that moment be like when he hands you a white stone engraved with a pet name that he has picked just for you and is secret between you and him? Forget about your dead dog, Rover. Forget about your new physique. Forget about your room with a view. There is only one thing that matters about heaven. God is there. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. When I look upon the face of the one who saved me by his grace. The Bible has many different descriptions of heaven from which we can learn many different things, but the overwhelming description of heaven is that we will be with God. Jesus said to the dying thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. Can I tell you, in paradise is not the exciting part of the promise. With me is the exciting part. I go to prepare a place for you and I'll come back and I'll take you home so that you can be with me. Paul said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. He wrote to the Philippians and said, I long to depart and be with Christ. We shall be caught up in the clouds to meet him in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. 
John said, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he shall dwell with them. What will heaven be like? We have so many detailed questions about how it will compare to life here on earth, but shouldn't our starting place be to imagine what it will be like to see God and to be with him? Job said, I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he shall stand on the earth and after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another, how my heart yearns within me. Beloved, I pray, I pray that God would give you an inspiring vision of heaven that would make your heart yearn within you. What will heaven be like? If we knew nothing more about heaven than that God is there, it would be enough. But pulling on scriptures all over the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, there are many things that we can say concretely about heaven. And I'd like to describe it a little bit for you. What will heaven be like? For one thing, heaven is a real place. Heaven is a real place. Beloved, heaven is not merely a state of consciousness. It's not a state of being. Heaven is an actual destination. Jesus said, if it weren't true, I would have told you. Heaven is not some figment of the human imagination designed to help us cope with our own mortality or to help with the grief when we've lost others. God made heaven. He prepared it, the Bible says, to be his final home that he shares forever with the holy angels and with the saints. Revelation chapters 21 through 22 contain the longest description of heaven in the Bible. And although it's full of symbols, I think there are some things that we can say for sure. The new Jerusalem is a real city with people and walls and structures and streets and rivers and trees. According to Hebrews 11, verse 6, the new Jerusalem already exists. God has already made it. It's already prepared. And after the final judgment, God will bring it to the recreated earth. Everything in our present world is a broken copy of what exists in perfection in heaven. So there's every reason to expect that all the creativity of God that is on display here will be found over there with even more that we've never seen. Not only is heaven a real place, but heaven is a far better place. Writing from a Roman prison cell, Paul told the Philippians, I'm not sure if I'm going to get out of this, and I'm not sure I really want to, because to die and go with, and be with Christ is far better. Why do we wrestle with fears and doubts and misgivings about heaven when the Bible tells us it's far better there? Where did we ever get the idea that we would be bored in heaven? Where did we ever get the idea that we would be homesick for earth, that we would miss anything or anyone here? Paul said when believers die, they don't lose anything, but they gain. You know, so many people have an uninspiring view of heaven. Even believers, and I would submit to you that Satan is the one that's behind that. Jesus called him the father of lies. He's a slanderer. He slanders men to God and he slanders God to men. Revelation 13, 6 says he opened his mouth to blaspheme God, to slander his name, his dwelling place, and all those who live there. So Satan slanders God's person, he slanders God's people, and he slanders God's dwelling place, heaven. Why would he do that? Why would he misrepresent heaven? Well, for one thing, he hates heaven. He was bounced out of heaven like a lousy drunk out of a bar. He's not welcome in heaven. And he wants to prevent us from going there too. 
God has deposited something inside the heart of every man that inclines him to believe that there is a heaven. There is a measure of faith that God has given. There is a ray of spiritual light that God has given. Solomon said he has set eternity in the hearts of men. So Satan doesn't waste his time trying to convince us that heaven doesn't exist. He just tries to convince us that it's boring. But the Bible says heaven is far better. We've already mentioned one reason why heaven is far better because Satan isn't there. One of the striking things about the description of heaven in Revelation 21 and 22 is the list of things that are not there in heaven. Death is not there. Mourning is not there. Crying is not there. Pain is not there. Sickness is not there. Sin is not there. The curse is not there. The perilous sea is not there. There's no temple. There's no night there. Last week we talked about the horrors of hell. You know, we really don't have any idea of the absolute horror of a place where God's grace is missing. Even though our world is broken by sin, still every person here is the recipient of and reliant upon God's loving kindnesses and his tender mercies and blessings. We have never seen the ferocity of a place where God's common grace doesn't exist. By the same token, we've never seen the beauty of a place that is absent of Satan and fallen angels and demons and the havoc that they cause. We've never seen the peace and the beauty of a place that is absent of sin and all the separation and brokenness it causes. We've never seen the beauty of a place that is absent of sickness and pain and mourning. Revelation 21 says nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful. We have never seen a place like heaven, but it will definitely be far better. Relationships in heaven will be different, but far better. That's the thing that we seem to be most anxious about. What will our relationships be like? Will my dad and mom still be my dad and mom? Will I still be married to my spouse? Will my kids still be my kids? Will my close friends still be close to me? First of all, I want to tell you that we will definitely all retain our identities in heaven. We will be recognizable and we will recognize everyone, but our relationships in heaven will be different. They will be far better. For one thing, we will relate to everyone in light of our perfected relationship with God. The consummation of our union with Jesus Christ will make us whole. It'll make us complete in every way. And that will change the nature of our relationship with everyone else. Paul said that earthly marriage is a picture of that. Denise and I are in a covenant marriage relationship with one another. We're bound in a one flesh union that is exclusive and life-giving and satisfying. Every other relationship that I have in life, even the ones that existed prior to knowing Denise, is affected by our marriage relationship. Every other relationship I have is subordinate and secondary to my marriage relationship, even my relationships with my kids. And the same thing is true in heaven. Every other relationship will be subordinate and secondary to our consummated relationship with him. We'll love our former spouses differently. We'll love our earthly children differently. We'll love our parents differently. Jesus said there's no marriage in heaven. There's no procreation. The covenant of earthly marriage, it concludes at death. In heaven, we'll belong to one another in a different way. But can I tell you, those new relationships, they will be far better. Because the brokenness of sin will be gone. All the junk that separates us from one another now will be gone. All the little insecurities that hinder intimacy will be gone. All the misunderstandings, all the accumulated disappointments... 
Defensiveness will be gone. There will be no urge or need to settle any scores. All the subtle little self-asserting ways will be gone. Critical and cynical and cutting remarks will be gone. You'll be connected to your parents or your spouse or your kids in a different way, but your new relationship with them will be far better. Beloved, it's not that you'll love your family or your close friends any less than you do here. It's that you'll love everyone else more than you do here. See, here we only have a very limited ability to, to love just a small circle of people, but there we'll have the capacity to love every citizen of heaven. Heaven is a far better place. Worship in heaven will be far better. It'll be far better because for the very first time, it will really be all about him. It'll no longer be about encouraging ourselves or comforting ourselves or congratulating ourselves or humbling ourselves. It'll only be about glorifying him. Worship in heaven will be far better because the barrier of sin will be completely removed so that we can worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. It'll be better because we'll be able to see the delight that our worship brings to God. You know, sometimes we live far away from family, from loved ones, so we have to mail birthday presents or mail Christmas presents to them. We don't get to see their reaction when they open. How much better is it when we can all come home for Christmas and we can see the delight when someone opens a gift that we've selected thoughtfully and lovingly. Worship in heaven will be far better because for the first time we'll get to watch God unwrap the gift of our adoration and we'll get to see the joy on his face. That's good preaching right there. I'm gonna make myself happy in a minute. What will heaven be like? Heaven is a fascinating and an active place. The outstanding feature of heaven is God's presence. Heaven is overflowing with his presence. There is no place in heaven where God is not. He is everywhere all at once and he's with everyone all at once. Life in heaven will revolve around our intimate relationship with him. The best part of heaven will be enjoying his presence. He will always be very personally with each one of us. His undivided attention will be permanently fixed on you. His eyes will be riveted on you. He'll be in constant dialogue with you. You know, the horror of hell is outer darkness. It's the state of utter isolation. Lost souls in hell will be alone forever. They will never again have the comfort of companionship, but the beauty of heaven is that we will live in the constant light of his presence. In heaven, you will never be alone again. But unlike relationships here, you won't want to get away from him. You'll never need a little break from him. You won't wish for some me time or some alone time. You'll never get, don't laugh too hard, you're going to get in trouble. You'll never be weary of his company. You'll never be bored with him. You'll never stop loving the sight of his face or the sound of his voice. You will need him like you need air. To be apart from his presence for even a second would be like suffocating. You'll never be at odds with him. You'll never be frustrated or disappointed or disagree. Jesus and Paul and John describe our relationship like a wedding celebration. You know, my wedding day was one of the greatest days of my entire life. I think the only thing that comes close in comparison is the day my children came into the world. I'll never forget the moment when I was standing on the altar and my eyes were fixed on the back door of the church and they opened and Denise came through. She was the only thing that I wanted to see. She was so stunning that I didn't take my eyes off her. I remember how honored I felt in that moment. I felt so honored that she picked me. I felt so honored that she said yes to me. I felt so honored while I was in graduate school in Missouri that she went home to Toronto and, and all alone planned such a beautiful wedding just for us. I was so honored when I saw her that she had gone to such great lengths to make herself so beautiful just to give herself to me. 
That's how Jesus is going to feel about us. John compares us to a bride dressed in fine white linen. And he says specifically, the white linen is not the righteousness of Christ. He says that the white linen that the bride is dressed in is the righteous deeds of the saints. Jesus is going to be honored by all your preparations here on earth for that day when you're united with him. He's going to be honored by every way that you pursued him in worship, in his word, in prayer, in fellowship. He's going to be honored by every pursuit you made of his character and likeness and nature. It's going to create a garment of fine white linen that honors him. My whole family was at my wedding. Denise's whole family was there. Our friends were there. Our best friends were there. Our close college friends were there. Some childhood friends, coworkers came from the seminary all the way from Missouri to Toronto to be there. Our beloved pastors who had shepherded us through years of our life were there. And the presence of all that company of people added immensely to our joy. But can I tell you, the whole day was really just about the two of us. Everyone else was on the periphery. Even when we went around to greet people at the reception, I didn't want to let go of Denise's hand, and I didn't want to take my eyes off of her. That's what heaven will be like. It will be all about you and God. The presence of everyone else will add immensely to your joy and you'll interact with them, but you and God, you will never take your eyes off of each other. You will be the same, but different in heaven. At the very end of this age, there will be a bodily resurrection of all the dead, both the righteous and the wicked. At the last judgment, Jesus will divide the righteous from the wicked. The wicked will go off to eternal punishment in hell, and the righteous will enter heaven in bodies of glorified flesh. Looking at Jesus in the New Testament, there's a few things that we know. First of all, you will still be you. You will retain your identity. You will retain your name, and you'll also get a secret pet name from Jesus. You will retain your gender and your race and your ethnicity. If you're black here, you'll be black there. If you're Hispanic here, you'll be Hispanic there. If you're white here, you still won't be able to jump over there. (laughs) Samuel was still Samuel when he scared the cackles out of the witch at Endor. Moses and Elijah were still Moses and Elijah when they appeared with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Abraham was still Abraham when the rich man called to him from agony and hell. The rich man was still the same person and Lazarus was still Lazarus in heaven. You will still be you, but you will look a little different too. When the disciples saw Jesus after he rose from the dead, they didn't recognize him at first glance, but then when they looked a little bit more closely, they did recognize him. And that will be you. It'll be you 2.0. You will be thinner. You'll look better. Your smile will be straighter and whiter. Your complexion will be more radiant. Your eyes will be brighter. You will always have a good hair day. And some of you will have hair again. <laughs> Years ago, I was, I was standing at the foyer, uh, and, and a woman, uh, this is my church in Philly, a, a woman named Ann came through the front door of the church. And another woman named Anne rushed over to greet her and she threw her arms around her and she meant to pay her a compliment. She really did, but it just came out all wrong. And she said, oh, Anne, you look so good, I hardly recognized you. (laughs) What, as if you normally looked like the cat dragged you in? You know, okay. But you know, that's what heaven's gonna be like. We're We're gonna walk around and say, hey, you look so good, I hardly recognized you. You look so good, I hardly recognized you. I don't know what age we'll be. I'm not sure that that really matters since we're going to be in eternity. But I've always imagined it this way. It's generally agreed that the age 25 or 26 is the peak age physically. And some argue that it's the peak age mentally as well. There's some research that suggests that by the age of 27, the effects of aging begins to set in on our mind. God help us. (laughs) So I like to imagine 
that our glorified body means that we will forever be at the peak. Jesus' resurrected body still has wounds from the cross. And beloved, they are not scars, they are fresh wounds. But I think that those are a special exception. Because of the blood of his eternal sacrifice, I believe that all our battle scars, I believe that all of our wounds, all of our injuries will be healed. In your glorified body, you will do some things that you used to do, and you'll be able to do some new things too. Jesus walked in his resurrected body. He listened, he talked, he touched, he sat, he cooked, he ate, and will do all of those familiar things too. In his resurrected body, Jesus also walked right through walls. He appeared, poof, and he disappeared. He ascended into the sky, and we'll be able to do those new things too. Think about what a killer game of hide-and-seek we'll be able to have with all those abilities. Not only will your body be transformed, but your inner nature, your character, will be completely transformed. In heaven, you will be confirmed in righteousness. Sin will never again be a temptation for you, nor a possibility for you. Deliverance, deliverance, Jesus, disobedience, selfishness, pride, they will forever be removed from you. Here we, we sing a hymn, Oh to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let your goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. But you know, in heaven there will be no such need for that prayer. Just like the world has never seen the, the beauty of a place that is absent of sin, no one has ever seen the beauty of you absent of sin. And I believe that that transformation will occur that moment that we see God face to face. John said it has not yet appeared what we shall become, but we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Heaven is a fascinating place. We will worship, we'll feast, we'll govern, and we'll serve. Some people wonder if heaven will be church forever. Yeah, you think my sermons are long now. Just wait. <laughs> worship around the throne of God with singing and shouting and bowing and dancing is definitely one of the things we'll do. I imagine that there will be every genre of earthly music except rap country western and southern gospel they will play on a continuous loop in hell I plan to sing with the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir for about 10,000 years maybe I'll sing with Israel and New Breed for a decade or two I want to sing in a classical choir I want to play in a symphony orchestra I want to play a concert grand piano a hundred feet long. I want to play the viola. I want to, I've always wanted to learn the string bass. I would love to play the French horn. I imagine music and singing and dancing from every tongue and tribe and nation. I imagine angelic music, the likes of which human ears have never heard. But I think we'll worship God in other ways too. In fact, everything we do in heaven will be worshiped. I think we'll worship God by recounting everything that he did for us and in us and through us. I think that we'll sit and we'll swap victory stories that bring God all the glory. And I think the angels will join in the conversation and I think they'll fill in the blanks and they'll tell us what was going on in the spirit realm around us when those victories were being won and we weren't even aware of how they were fighting for us. Maybe your worship will involve composing poetry or prose. Maybe your worship will involve dance or movement or acrobatics. Maybe it'll involve art or craftsmanship. The Bible says we'll also feast in heaven. Along with God's presence and worship, feasting is one of the most frequent descriptions of what we'll do in heaven. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus promised the disciples that they would eat and drink together in his heavenly kingdom. In Isaiah, it says that God himself will prepare a feast for us and serve us. God said the Jewish feasts are established forever. I'm not even qualified to teach on that. What could be more satisfying, though, than sitting at a table and enjoying great food and the company of the people that you love? 
The Bible says we'll be assigned administrative duties in heaven. I don't have any idea what those will be, but the Bible says we will be assigned jurisdiction over other created beings and over other spheres of God's creation. We'll also serve in heaven. John says no longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city and his servants shall serve him. Here's an interesting thought for you. When God created the heavens and the earth, some things he spoke into existence and other things he fabricated with his own hands. And even though everything God created was good, even though he created a perfectly self-sustaining world, it still required the stewardship of mankind to maintain it. Could it be the same in heaven? We'll live forever in bodies of glorified human flesh. We'll worship, we'll eat, we'll live in spaces that Jesus has prepared for us. So where will we get all the amenities that we'll use? If I want to learn the viola, will a viola just poof, immediately appear? Or will one need to be fabricated? Will I be able to sit down and play instantly like Van Cliburn, or will I have to start by learning to locate middle C? You know, Jesus emptied himself, and he came as a baby to our world. He had to learn everything about our world from scratch. So perhaps we'll have to learn everything about his world the same way. Is it possible that our service to God in heaven will include the joy of imagining and designing and fabricating all the things that we'll use? What would you like to try your hand at in heaven? Would you like to try gardening? Would you like to try flower arranging? Would you like to try woodworking, carpentry, cabinet making? You know, we're going to need a lot of chairs for the marriage supper of the Lamb. Would you like to try cooking? Do you like to try your hand at wine making? You need to find a little old Italian. I'll help you with that. Would you like to try sewing, embroidery, knitting, event planning? Would you like to learn how to throw pottery? Or would you like to learn glass making or metalworking or gemology? How about surveying, map making, exploring the new earth that God is going to create? What about urban planning? How about the sciences, unlocking the mysteries of the universe or studying astronomy? I don't know what we will do, but I can tell you for sure, heaven will not be boring. What will heaven be like? Heaven will be a comfortably familiar place. When you get to heaven, you will feel completely at home. Heaven will be a perfect fit for you. You'll be completely at ease there. You'll feel very comfortable with your surroundings. The Bible says that here we are aliens. We're strangers. We're pilgrims. We're nomads. We are citizens of a better country. You know, traveling is exciting. But there's nothing like coming back to the comforts of your own home. Last week, Pastor Bobby and I were in Kuala Lumpur at the School of Acts, and our friend Pastor Raymond is the most gracious host you could ever have. He does everything he can to make you feel welcome and comfortable, but you know, it's just not home. The people look different, their language is different, their food is different, their lifestyle is different. There are four Mongo locks to get into the speaker's apartment where we stay while we're over there. There are iron bars over every door and over every window and they are needed in even the best of neighborhoods. The hot water heater comes from a little electric box that's mounted on the inside of the shower and if you're lucky it'll just take the edge off the cold water. As much as I enjoy my friends at the School of Acts, I always look forward to coming back to the comforts of my own home. I like coming home to what's familiar. I like coming home to where I belong. I like coming home to my family, and I like coming home to you. And that's how you'll feel when you get to heaven. The writer of Hebrews explains why. He says that we are already citizens of that place, and already here on earth we taste that place. He wrote, you haven't come to a mountain that is burning with fire and is cloaked in darkness and gloom and storms, but you have come to Mount Zion. You have come to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. 
You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all men, the spirits of righteous men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. The writer of Hebrews says, listen, when you gather together, when the presence of God comes in your midst, you begin to taste, you begin to feel, you begin to experience just a little bit of the glory that happens in the throne room of God. And that's why when you get there, it'll feel familiar to you. I asked you to wear blue today. Thank you for everyone who wore blue. Here's the reason why. A couple of years ago, I was sitting in my seat while we were worshiping. And when I opened my eyes, I, I could see the color blue. The whole, the whole front of the sanctuary was bathed in the color blue. We didn't have these fancy schmancy lights that throw different colors on the wall back then. It was just the regular white house lighting. But I could see the whole front of the church bathed in blue. And I asked the Holy Spirit, I said, what, what is that? And he just said to me, it's the color of heaven. We were tasting and experiencing. I went out and bought this tie uh, right after that because I wanted to find something that approximated the color of blue that I saw here in this place. You are citizens of a better country. And when we gather to worship, you get a little taste of that. And that's why when you get home, it'll feel so comfortable to you. What's heaven like? Gotta go, I'm in big trouble. Heaven is a joyful place. Joy is the mood of heaven. Joy is the atmosphere of heaven. Isaiah said everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. Personally, I believe that the painful memories from life on this earth will be wiped out completely. And I believe that we won't be aware of the lost soul's suffering in hell. I believe that based on the story of the rich man and Lazarus. I can't go into it this morning. But there will be nothing in heaven that will cloud our joy. What will heaven be like? Heaven is a timeless place. There's an interesting contrast I find between the passing of time in heaven and in hell. About hell, it says they shall have no rest day or night. It says they shall be tormented day and night. But about heaven, it says there shall be no night. And I believe that this speaks to a difference in the awareness of the passing of time. Lost souls in hell will be woefully aware of the passing of decades and centuries and millennia with no hope to an end or even the slightest attenuation of their suffering, but heaven is eternal life. It's when I spoke this that the clock froze. Maybe time will freeze right now and I'll have enough time to finish my sermon. Listen, listen to this, catch this. Eternity is time, is not time without end. Eternity is timelessness. So I like to think of it this way. You know those moments when you're having the best time ever with the one that you love. And you're having so much time that hours and hours roll by and you're completely oblivious to the passing of time. You don't know how much time has elapsed and you really don't care and you really don't want it to end. That's what heaven will be like. Four truths about heaven. Only one thing will matter about heaven. God is there. I'm going to give you the next three super quick and we'll be done. Second truth about heaven. There is only one way to heaven. There is only one way to heaven. Jesus told the disciples, heaven is a real place. I'm going back there and you know the way. But Thomas objected, Lord, we don't know the way. Then Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I have good news for you today. If you want to go to this wonderful place called heaven, there is a GPS that will lead you straight there. Do you want to know what the GPS is? It's God's plan of salvation. Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, left his throne in heaven. He emptied himself. He put on a body of human flesh. God himself became something substantively that he previously was not. He was born of a virgin, Mary. 
He lived a sinless life of perfect submission and obedience to God the Father. God handed him over to the rulers of the Jewish people. The Jewish rulers handed him over to the vile Roman rulers who nailed Jesus to a cross. In that moment, Jesus took upon himself the sins of the entire world. God made him to become sin. He who knew no sin, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. His innocent blood was poured all over the ground to pay the price for our freedom. The author of life tasted death. He was buried in a tomb, but on the third day he rose again and he defeated death and hell and the grave. The GPS that will lead you straight to heaven is God's plan of salvation. It is to believe on Jesus. It is to receive from Jesus the forgiveness of sins and the washing of his blood. It's to become his follower for life and to enter into that love relationship today that will be consummated one day in heaven. There is only one way to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way. He didn't say, I am a way. He didn't say, I am the best way. He said, I am the way, the one and only way. I am the gate. I am the door to salvation. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live even though he dies. Four truths about heaven. The third truth is this. There's only one thing that matters about heaven. There's only one way to heaven. Third truth is this. Gotta fly. There's only one alternative to heaven. There is only one alternative to heaven. Beloved, the Bible is very clear. There are only two roads that lead to two possible destinations at the end of this life. There is a narrow road called Jesus that leads to eternal life in heaven, or there is a broad road that leads to eternal suffering in hell. There are no other alternatives. There are are no in-between places. To come back to earth again and again in another form is not an option. To wish yourself out of existence at the end of this life is not an option. To become absorbed into the amorphous energy of the universe is not an option. The Bible says it has been appointed unto men once to die, and after that, the judgment. And that brings us to the fourth and final truth about heaven. Worship team, you better save me. Fourth and final truth about heaven. There is only one chance to choose heaven. There is only one chance to choose heaven. Beloved, listen to me. May you hear God's voice this morning. Don't wait until someone is dialing 911 for you to think about heaven. Don't wait until the end of life. Don't wait until your body is still alive, but your mind has lost conscious contact with the world. Don't wait until there's an ambulance racing to come rescue you. Don't wait until your family is gathered around your bedside. In order to choose heaven, you must choose Jesus before life on this earth is over. Some people have already decided to reject Jesus. We know that. But many others have decided just not to make a decision about him. But beloved, listen, the decision not to make a decision about Jesus is a decision. The decision not to accept him now is the decision to reject him for all of eternity. Some people have this mistaken idea that they'll have the opportunity to make their choice when this life is over. I've had people say to me, Pastor Glenn, I'll just wait and see what I find when I get there and then I'll make my choice. But Jesus said that's not the way it works. It will be too late then. In hell, the rich man begged Abraham, I'm in agony in this fire. Please, Father Abraham, send Lazarus back to warn my brothers about hell, to tell them about heaven. 
But Abraham said to him, if they refuse to believe the Bible, they will not believe even if a dead man rises from the grave. Beloved, once this life is over, it's too late then to choose heaven. So today, if you hear God's voice, don't harden your heart. Paul said, set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. One way that verse could be translated is meditate on the things above, ponder the things above, imagine about the things above. I've had a little fun with you this morning sharing what I imagine about heaven based on what I've read in the Bible, but I want you to take a moment and I want you to imagine for yourself. I want you to close your eyes and we're going to play a song, you know it, it's called I Can Only Imagine, and I want you to think about what heaven will be like. May God give you an inspiring vision of heaven. Listen and think. Do you stand together with me this morning? I know that my Redeemer lives. And though my flesh, though my skin might be destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God. I myself shall see Him with my own eyes, I and not another. How my heart yearns within me. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would give every heart here an inspiring vision of the hope of heaven. Would you bow your heads with me real quickly all over this place? We have to go, but before we do, I have to ask this question. Our time is past, but I can't let you go before I ask this. Do you know that you know that you know that you know that you're going to heaven. You know, you can know for sure. Jesus said so. If you don't know that you're going, what could possibly be more important in this life than to make sure that you escape hell and that you enter heaven where we'll ever be with the Lord? If you're here this morning and you don't know for sure, I want to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart to receive his gift of eternal life. If you'd like to pray that prayer with me while heads are bowed, I just want you to lift up your hand high and then we're going to pray. Come on, there's hands everywhere. Come on, there's hands all over this place. You want to pray that prayer? Yeah, I can't even count. I want to pray that prayer. I want to pray that prayer. I want to invite Jesus. I want to know that I know that I know. Thank you, Father. Come on, would you lift your hands, everybody, all over this place with me? And I want to lead us in this prayer. If you're already a believer and you know that you are, pray it with us again, because it feels so good to say it every time. Come on, we're going to invite Jesus. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna turn on. You're going to switch on that GPS that's going to lead you straight to heaven. God's plan of salvation is about to kick in when you say this prayer and invite Jesus into your heart. Lift up your hands, everybody. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lead you follow in a nice, loud voice. Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving me. Father, thank you for sending your only son. Jesus, thank you for coming. You lived for me. You died on the cross for me. Jesus, I believe you are the son of God. I believe you rose from the dead. I confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord. Jesus, I'm coming to you. I need you. I've sinned. I've fallen short of the glory of God. I've disobeyed. Jesus, forgive me. Wash me clean. Jesus, make me new. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Jesus, I want to go to heaven. I want to see your face. I want to live forever with you. Jesus, I receive you now as my Lord and the true leader of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise in this place. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. 
hey, we're going to heaven. We're going to be with Jesus forever. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody give a good shout and celebrate. That's great news. Thank you, Jesus. All right, listen, this is going to be our benediction. God's going to be with you. Our friend Brian Simmons, Wednesday through Friday and next weekend. This is our benediction. I want you to hug five people and I want you to tell them, I'm glad I'm saved and I'm glad you're saved too. God bless you, everyone. It's going to be a great week. Go tell somebody about heaven this week. Jesus be with you.